grounding, bonding, floating, neutrals, this can all get very confusing, especially when you're designing a solar energy system. Let's see if we can make some of these terms clear, real clear. In this video, we'll learn about the difference between grounding and bonding. What is a floating neutral? What is a bonded neutral? We'll also look at earth ground, grounding cables and equipment grounds, as well as common misconceptions, such as electricity always tries to return to ground. In the second video of this series, we'll go into details of grounding and bonding specifically as it applies to solar power inverters. So let's get started. To make things easier to understand, this video will be based on normal grid-based household wiring as found in the United States. Keep in mind, grounding systems operate differently in Europe and the rest of the world. Power from the grid passes through a transformer, which drops the voltage to about 240 volts. Power, of course, goes through your meter, and then it goes to your main service panel. Line one and two carry the power into the panel. These are referred to as hot. If you measure across them, you have 240 volts. From the sensor tap on the secondary transformer, another cable called the neutral is also connected to the main panel. If you measure from line one to the neutral, it is around 120 volts. From line two to the neutral is also around 120 volts. So all in all, we have two 120-volt circuits and a 240-volt circuit available. This is known as split phase. The neutral cable is attached to a neutral bus bar. In the panel, neutral bus bars look like this. And you can see that all of the neutral cables connect to this bus bar. Because this is the main panel, we will also hook a grounding rod up to this bus bar. So by connecting the neutral bus bar and ground together, we say that they are bonded. That is when two or more components are joined together. Now, sometimes there's only one bus bar and it works as both a neutral and a ground bar. Sometimes there's a separate bus bar for ground and neutral, and they're bonded together, either with a piece of copper or a um, wire connector. Now let's add a load to this system. Let's run something with it. So line one is going to go up here and go through a circuit breaker. In the panel, it looks like this. And we're going to run down to the load. Um, it could come out through a switch. It can come out through a wall outlet, so forth. And this light bulb could be anything. It doesn't have to be a light bulb. It could be a toaster oven, a TV set, or whatever. It's going to return from the neutral back to the neutral bus bar and back up through the neutral to the transformer and complete a circuit. And now you've got a light bulb that's lit up and everyone's happy. Uh, we also could have used line two and done the same thing. So line two could go through a breaker, go to the load and return on the neutral. Okay, so now let's talk about the ground. The case of the appliance, whether it's a lamp or a TV or a toaster or whatever, especially if it's a metal case, is going to be grounded and that's done by a piece of wire that's actually mounted onto the case itself and the other end of this wire would be attached to the ground of the plug along with the neutral and a hot so this adding of a wire to the case of a piece of equipment is known as the equipment grounding conductor and it's required on all metal cases the ground then connects through the house wiring back to the ground slash neutral bus bar. Ordinarily, there should be no power traveling on this ground wire. It's not part of this circuit that operates the appliance. Now, let's say that the hot wire accidentally makes contact with the case. This is called a ground fault. At this point, the case is energized and power will travel down the ground wire. The question is, where does it go then? Electricity tries to return to where? Many people say electricity tries to return to ground, but uh, actually electricity is always trying to return to its source. So what it actually is going to do is go back up through the neutral bus bar, through the neutral cable out to the transformer, 
It's going to complete the circuit. The circuit breaker is going to get really hot and trip, and then the circuit would be safe again because it's unenergized. Let's fix that ground fault and move line one back up where it needs to be. Okay, so that was a ground fault. Now, we're going to look at a short circuit, which is similar, except here, line one and the neutral make contact. It could happen inside of the appliance. It could also happen just in the wiring. Um, say the insulation gets um, destroyed on the outside of the wiring and the two wires touch. But the circuit completes like this. And because there's no resistance now, there's no load, this circuit breaker is going to overheat and trip. And that, of course, protects the circuit. Okay, so we haven't talked about this ground down here going to the ground rod. When is that used? Well, a couple of cases that it could be carrying some, some current. Let's go back and have a ground fault. If a person were touching the case of the appliance, especially if they were standing in water, when the ground fault occurred, some of the electricity could travel through them, through the earth, through the ground rod, and then back up to complete the circuit. Uh, now, the ground or the earth is going to have higher resistance than the actual ground cable going through the wall. However, enough energy could still travel through you to potentially kill you. So what else is the ground for? Mostly to get rid of high voltage surges. And that would be things like lightning, grid surges, and even static charges. We're going to make this a little more complicated and add a sub panel, which is just another breaker panel added for convenience, perhaps at the other end of the house, in an outbuilding, a studio, a garage, um, so forth. The main panel is fed on line one and two, just like before, to the main bus bars, which are what hold your breakers. We're also going to have a neutral coming in from the grid going to the neutral slash ground bus bar, and that is going to be grounded to the grounding rod outside, just like before. So to feed the sub panel, we're going to carry a line one and a line two over to the sub panel. Now, it's not being shown on this drawing, but right there where those circles are, those would be breakers, usually pretty hefty breakers, maybe 50, 100 amps or so. Okay, and over here on the sub panel, we're going to have a separate neutral bus and a separate ground bus. They're not combined together like they were over on the main service panel. The neutral bus from the sub panel connects back to the neutral slash ground bus of the main panel. And the ground bus on a separate cable also connects back over to the neutral slash ground bus bar. So the main service panel is said to be bonded neutral, meaning the neutral and the ground are bonded together in that panel. But the sub panel is known as a floating neutral. It is not bonded. They are two separate bus bars. Rule number one, there can only be one neutral ground bond in your entire electrical system. Now we're going to add a load to the system and see how it operates. So just like before, we're going to feed line one, except now we're in the sub panel, comes back on the neutral, and we're going to connect a ground. And the pathway for a normal circuit is going to look like this. Our power comes in from the grid through the main service panel, through a breaker, jumps over to the sub panel through another breaker, feeds the load, comes back on the neutral to the neutral bus bar in the sub panel, follows a cable all the way back to the neutral slash ground bus bar in the main panel, and then back up to the grid again to complete the circuit. Okay, so what happens in the case of a ground fault? So here we're showing again line one is touching the case of the load and this is now the path. So again, you see the ground bus bar is not connected to the neutral in the sub panel, but it jumps all the way back over through the cable to get back up to neutral and complete the circuit. And again, our breaker is going to get hot and blow and it deactivates the circuit, makes it safe again.
So let's connect things back up the way they should be. So line one is back on the load and off of the, off of the case. We remember that there can only be one neutral ground bond. Why do we not connect or bond together the neutral and the ground over in the sub panel? So let's take a look at that. We're going to add a bond in here. And that, again, could be a cable or a piece of copper. So now what happens when you run a regular load? Well, of course, it's following the normal path. That's, that's what's here. But in addition to that, some of the power now is jumping over. It's trying to get back to source. It has two paths there now. So watch this. So we now have two paths to get back to the source, which is this neutral of the transformer outside. And this neutral line here connecting the sub panel, as well as this ground connecting the sub panel, they're both carrying voltage now. They both are carrying current. The electricity traveling on the ground wire is known as objectionable current. And this current could potentially even travel to the cases of your appliances and make them dangerous. In a normally functioning circuit, the return path is on the neutral cable. And there should be no current at all on the ground cable. If one of the hot wires touches the case ground of an appliance, it's known as a ground fault. Current will then flow through the grounding cable to the neutral bus bar and trip the breaker. We also talked about rule number one, which is there can only be one neutral ground bond in your entire electrical system. The main service panel should have the neutral ground bond. Sub panels should not be bonded. In part two of this video, we'll look at how to use this information to wire up solar inverters. See you there.